Hey guys, welcome to the Summit Heights Fellowship broadcast. My name is Edward Crouch and I'm the lead pastor here at Summit Heights. And before we get to our broadcast, I just wanted to say thank you for joining us. If you have a few minutes today, check out our website, summitheightsfellowship.com. And you'll learn all about our church. We have a great student ministry, an incredible children's ministry, preschool ministry. And we do small groups all over our community, from Mineola to Quitman to Winsboro, Hawkins, even in Big Sandy. We would love to have you check us out one Sunday. If there's anything we could ever do for you, please take a few minutes, go to our website, fill out that prayer card on our website, and we would love to pray for you, reach out to you, or minister to you in any way we can. Again, thanks for joining us today. We hope you enjoy the broadcast. If there's any decisions or questions you have at the end of our broadcast, please reach out to us at our number on the screen or on our website. We would love to visit with you. Have a great day. Enjoy the broadcast. Amen. You can be seated. You know, that song goes right into what we're talking about today. Last Monday, as I was praying, I was out in my backyard and uh, the kids were going to school and, and I was just, I was thinking about this Sunday and I was thinking about, Lord, where do, where, where do we go? How long do we talk about failure? Because honestly, I could talk about failure probably for the next 26 weeks and we wouldn't run out of material, would we? And here's what I've learned. If you spend too much time talking about failure, you'll go absolutely crazy because there's not a person in this room that when we talk about this, every one of us are extremely needy. And the more we talk about it, the more we realize, holy cow, I am really needy. I was reading this last week and uh, came across Neil T. Anderson's material. And if you're not familiar with him, just awesome material. And he, he, he made this statement. He goes, I, I, love, I love to ask people, who are you? What makes you feel like a person of worth? Who are you? And he goes on to say, he would ask someone, who are you? And I might answer, well, I'm Edward Crouch. And he would say, no, that's your name. Who are you? Oh, I get it. I'm the pastor at Summit Heights Fellowship. And he would say, no, 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 no. That's what you do. Who are you? Well, I'm an American. He would say, no, that's where you live. Then I'm an evangelical. And he says, no, that's your preference of denomination. I could say I'm five foot nine and 150 pounds. Mm. <laughs> that would be a lie. <laughs> I'm trying. <laughs> See, our physical dimensions and appearance, however, is not me either. He goes on to say, if you chopped off my arm, would I still be me? Yeah. If you chopped off my other arm, would I still be me? Yeah. And if they chopped off both of my legs, would I still be me? Yes. Now, eventually, if you cut enough of me, you're going to get to me. Amen? That's true of all of us. But who I am, though, is far more than what you see on the outside, and who you are is far more than what you see on the outside. And yet, we spend so much time on the outside, don't we? I'll never forget, I was in third grade, and I was sitting in my closet. We had just lost a, a cousin of mine to death, and uh, you know, in third grade, you don't understand all of death, and you really don't understand who you are, but I, I, I vividly remember this. As I was sitting in my closet there in Longview at my parents' house, and, and I began to look at my arms, and I began to look at my hands, and I started pulling up my skin, and, and I know it sounds weird, but I started asking, just, what am I? Who am I? And I remember as a third grader even thinking, what are we? I know that seems, for some of you, you're probably going, you're weird. <laughs> and so are you. I get it. But who are you? Are you the person that you pretend to be? Have you ever thought about who you really are or why you were born? See, we've been talking about this the last couple of weeks. Are you just a physical being who makes a living hoping for a little pleasure in life and then you're going to die? Or is there more to you? And if someone got to know you, would they like you? See, I, I know some of us struggle with that question because we're not sure we want people to know us. But see, who we are is far more than what you see or what I can do. In fact, Neil T. Anderson says this, people cannot consistently behave in ways that are inconsistent with the way they perceive themselves. You can't consistently behave in ways that are inconsistent with the way you perceive yourself. So the last couple of weeks, we've been kind of digging around in the soul a little bit, you know, and it's been fun for some of us. For others of us, you've been real quiet. 
Because when you dig around in the soul, you start poking around in things that cause us to wonder who we are. So a couple of weeks ago, I introduced this diagram to you that even at conception that God knew you and he knew what he wanted for you. In fact, he had certain potential for you that when you were born because he had gifted us and he's gifted us to perform at a certain level based on who we are, not what we do, not what we look like or anything else, but based on what God says. And when our reality doesn't line up with that potential because of our perception of ourself, it creates what's called a frustration gap. And if we don't do something with that frustration gap, then and what we will start doing is try to fill that gap or we'll start moving down into a, what we call the failure gap. And what we do in that situation is, is we hide and we cover up. We lie about our past. We lie about who we are. We try to be something we're not. And we try to pretend that everything is okay. And then we go into that blame shifting. That we will blame others or we'll just accept all the blame. And we start getting in this crazy cycle of shame and we compensate by trying to over excel in areas that God never wanted us to over excel in because we're too busy comparing ourselves with each other. Or we'll criticize others who have the same weaknesses. We call that mirroring. We're looking at them and they're a mirror to you because the things that frustrate you is probably something that's inside of you. Or we self-medicate and we numb. You see, because everybody as I introduced to you a couple weeks ago, has twin towers of truth in their life. And we've been talking about this tower of failure over the last few weeks, about every one of us, that the whole scripture is full of men and women who were colossal failures. And it was God's response to failure in that. And then when we became new in Christ, when we surrendered our life to Christ, I'm talking to you guys in here that have a relationship with Jesus Christ, that when you surrendered your life to Jesus Christ, you were given a new identity. And so God took all your failures and all your identity, and he created this powerful thing called story. And what our hope is, is that for all of us in this room, that we will round out our story of grace and we'll move on to hope. And we've said this every week over and over and over again. Failure is never final as long as love exists. Failure is never final as long as love exists. And I know some of you in this room, man, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, maybe 10 years ago, maybe five years ago, maybe about five hours ago, <laughs> you failed. You messed it up. And maybe you didn't fail, but there was a, an incredible amount of pain that came into your journey because someone did something, and you're stuck in this tower of failure. You're stuck here, and you have not rounded out your story to hope. That you're just stuck in the same old stories of who you think you are. And yet, here's what God shared with me Monday morning as I was in my backyard praying. He said, Edward, it's time that we talk about hope, our identity, who we are in Christ what it means that we're a new creation, that God has made us new. I love what David Elmore said a few weeks ago, and I keep coming back to this statement. I want to remind you of this, because you see, it's not what happens to us that messes us up. It's the stories we tell ourselves about what happened to us is what really messes us up. It's amazing how that story will change over the years. And it doesn't even look like the story of really what happened, because once you move past the story and move on to shame and move on to guilt, that becomes that reoccurring story in our life. And at some point, we have to round out our stories to hope. One of the things that frustrates me in recovery ministries and recovery groups is that they never move on to hope. They're always stuck as an addict or they're always stuck back here. It's what I love about Celebrate Recovery. It's what I love about Summit Heights because we want people to understand, yes, you may struggle with something, but it's time to round that story out to hope because failure is never final as long as love exists. And we've got to come to the point where we recognize that our value is not dependent upon our performance, our titles, our looks, our achievements, or the power that we think we have or the power we actually have, that is so much more. And it exists independently of anything we've ever done or will do in the future. You see, without the grace of God, that's only found in the 
Son of God, Jesus Christ, our best efforts, our most incredible acts are just like filthy rags. Isaiah 64, 6. And some of us are trying so hard to measure up on our looks, our performance, on what we do. And yet, something's missing, isn't it? Over and over again, it seems like you just can't get a break. And everything we might learn about our dark side will be insignificant if we fail to find our value in Christ. The more we spend over here in this tower of failure, we'll never move on to hope until we understand that all of this has to be put in light of who we are in Christ. See, there's this thing in the New Testament called the indicative and the imperative. And it's a tension between the indicative and the imperative. The indicative is what God has already done and what is already true about us. It's what's already done. It's what's already true about this. And the imperative is what remains to be done. As we respond to the indicative by faith and obedience and the power of the Holy Spirit. That there's this tension going on in Scripture. That you have to know and believe positional truth in order to su successfully progress along in your sanctification or holiness. You've got to understand that who you are in Christ before you can begin to move towards holiness. That positional sanctification or holiness is the basis for our progressive sanctification of us becoming like Christ. And the balance between the indicative and the imperative is about equal in Scripture. But we seem to focus more on the imperatives in church. And maybe you grew up like I did in a church that was always instructing you how to act. Do this, don't do that, do this, don't do that. I remember growing up, they were always telling us, don't do this, don't do that, don't do this, don't do that, don't do this, don't do that. Don't, 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 don't. And guess what? We didn't do a whole lot. We knew how to behave, but there was nothing behind that of who we were. And you got to have both of those. Many of us have attended church for years and we've not heard enough about positional truth to understand that we are children of God and we are alive and we are free in Christ. I've said this over and over again from the stage for almost 14 years as your pastor that I believe there's a whole lot more freedom in following Christ than how we grew up. There is a whole lot more freedom. The problem is we've, we've, we've just told people what to do. And they become incredible actors and actresses in the kingdom. But they don't understand who they are. <laughs> and we attend church and we hear that. And so therefore what happens is many people have never repented. And never really gone back and dug around in the soul. And so for the last couple of weeks as we've been digging around in the souls of our hearts. Some of us are like, oh my gosh, would you move on? <laughs> I'm done with this. I can't do much more of this. See, I think it's imperative for us to balance those twin towers of truth and round our stories out to hope, to know who we are in Christ, that our greatest source of worth should come from the knowledge that we are known by God and declared righteous in Christ, that we are right with God. And listen, and I'm talking to believers this morning. If you're not a believer, this is not true of you, okay? I'm talking to you that have, that have surrendered your life to Christ, that you are made right in the sight of God. I know some of you don't believe that because of that event that took place 30 years ago or, or, or three years ago or maybe 10 years ago that you're stuck there and you're just thinking God could never forgive me because you don't understand what I did to that guy and you don't understand what he did to me or what she did and, and you don't understand I was a thief or, or all those things way back in our past and you're stuck there because you, you just can't get past that. But listen, we are made right with God through the righteousness of Jesus Christ because of what he did, not based on anything we have done, but based on the person and work of Jesus Christ. And we reflect on this series and we gain reflection and self-knowledge. If we're not careful, we'll spend all of our time over here and we'll learn all about the failures of the Bible, but we'll never understand what God's response is. And God's response was Jesus Christ, that we are not who we used to be. That we're not stuck over here. I've always been this way. I'm just always going to be that way. Then Jesus is not your Savior. Death is. You see, we've been given a new life in Christ. We've been given a new person in Christ. And when we, we 
view our physical stance with our spiritual stance, things begin to change. In fact, there's two sources of life. I want to show you this on the screen. We're told in the scriptures that one is earthly, the other is heavenly. That one is physical and the other is spiritual. One ultimately leads to death, the other to eternal life. And so when we look at that, we both have a condition and a position or a state here on earth and a standing before God. And you got to understand this. You got to hear this because our first birth provided us with a physical body. But because of that first birth, we were placed in, we were born in, we came in to a sinful condition on this earth. And we're going to see that in just a minute. But the new birth in Christ, when we surrendered our life to Jesus Christ, we then were, 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 were born into a new life, eventually a new body, amen, skinny with hair and flowing and all that, amen? And it places us now, listen to me, listen, you got to hear this. It places us now in a holy position in heaven so that when God looks at us from our spiritual condition, our spiritual condition and our standing position now, God sees us as holy. You see, look at this. Our position in Christ is in heaven. It's spiritual and it leads to life. Our condition on earth is that it's earthly, it's physical, and this body will die. And if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, I'm just going to tell you, that'll be the end for you. And you will be eternally separated from Jesus Christ. So the question comes, which source do you derive your value as people, as leaders, as employees, as employers, as students, as parents, as spouses? Do your kids look at you and just say, well, your job is your life? Or is there more to you than your job? Is there more to you than what you do? You see, our worth as God's people is what results from our position in Christ rather than our condition on earth. And it's so easy to look at our condition on earth and forget who we are and what Christ has done. Because it's easy for us to focus on that. You see, Christian growth takes place as we appropriate what we already know, who we are in Christ, our position by faith, and then practice that in our earthly lives, our condition. In other words, out of obedience and faith, we then begin to practice what's already true of us spiritually. Hopefully, most of you in this room that know Jesus are growing spiritually, that you're progressing in your walk with Christ, and we're not perfect. We're going to make mistakes, amen? We're going to mess up. We're going to experience failures and struggles. As parents, we're not perfect parents, are we? Don't raise your hand, because we're not. And if we look at our earthly state to receive our worth, then we're certainly going to be disappointed. But if we concentrate on what we actually are in our standing before God, we'll discover that we are valuable. Neil T. Anderson uses an illustration called Plan A and Plan B. That Plan A is basically this. It's determined by our personal conviction that God's way or design is always right. And, and by how committed you are to believe him. That that's Plan A. God, you are right, and what you say of me is true, that I am fully loved, I am fully forgiven, that I am made right before you, that my righteousness is not based on my works, it's based on who you are. But there's always a plan B, isn't there? Isn't it amazing how many times we keep a plan B out there? Because plan B is basically determined by the amount of time and energy you invest in entertaining thoughts that are contrary to God's word. Because many of us spend more time Spending our thoughts over here that I'm a failure, that I'm no good, that I'm not loved, that God will never forgive me, that God, God's not a good God, and there's no way God could be a good God because look at all the stuff. And the more time we spend over there, guess what eventually will happen? That's your plan. And that's who you'll become. You see, I don't have a plan B for my marriage. It's plan A. I believe that Danielle is my wife. Not only is she my wife on paper, She's my wife that I am in a covenant with her. That even if she doesn't do her part, guess what? I'm still doing mine. There's no door that I'm holding back. There's no lock that I've got on there that I can make a run for. No, it's plan A. And I don't even want to spend time on plan B. You see, many of us, we keep that plan B just in case. And it's no wonder you struggle. Because as long as there's an option... 
You're going to always try to figure out the best way. I'm going to go ahead and get my job. And just in case this marriage doesn't work, just in case this thing doesn't work out. You see, walking by faith means that we live according to the truth, not by feelings. By the way, do you know everybody has faith? I hear people say, ah, oh, that old faith thing, I don't agree with that. And y'all are just crazy. Really, you got faith? Do you know that every one of you use faith this morning? Let me give you a couple examples. Number one, you sat down in that chair you're sitting in. How many of you flopped down and how many of you sat down? Don't look at your husband, okay? There's a difference between sitting and flopping, amen? Some of you know what I'm talking about. But you use faith to sit in that chair and you never even thought about it, did you? Never crossed your mind. You want to know why? Because for years and years and years, you practiced plan A, and someone told you if you'll sit in that chair, that chair will hold you. And the first time you're like, eh, and then now you're just like, ah, flopping down. Some of you are going to go outside, and you're going to use an incredible act of faith. And you, you, you probably hadn't even thought about it today, but you either have a key or a key fob. And you're going to go out and get in your car and you're going to push a button or you're going to put a key in that car. And by faith, that car, when you turn that key or you push that button, that car is going to crank. Amen? That's faith. Walking by faith in the spiritual sense means that we're living according to the truth of what God says about us. You see, we don't follow God to be loved. We are loved, so we follow him. Let me say that again. We don't follow God to be loved. We are loved. And that's why we follow him. We don't serve God to gain his acceptance. We're accepted. Look, listen to me. Look at me. Don't miss this. You are accepted based on Jesus Christ. I don't care how many people you've slept with. I don't care how many dollars you've stolen. I, I don't care how many churches you've been to. You are accepted based on the person and work of Jesus Christ. So we serve God when we surrender to him. And listen to me, it's not what you do that determines who you are. It's who you are that determines what you do. And to live the life that God called you to, to the potential he created you for. You have to have certain beliefs about what God says about you and believe that they're already true of you. The problem is we have an enemy, don't we? The scripture is very clear about the enemy and, and that, that he is the father of lies, that some of you have bought the father of lies, that he's been lying to you, that you're not worthy, that you can never be pure, that you can never be forgiven. Revelation talks that he's the accuser of the body, that he's coming and accusing you of things. And that's where some of you are stuck in that. And at times you feel worthless. You're over here in this tower of failure. And other times he's pulling you down. And we concentrate on our condition instead of living by faith of what God says we are. And those times where we're frustrated and weak and defeated, we walk by faith, not by sight. Listen to me. What you see, what you hear, and what you feel will lie to you if it doesn't line up with the Word of God. Let me say that again. What you see, what you hear, and what you feel will lie to you if it doesn't line up with the Word of God. And a lot of you, what you're seeing what you're feeling. And listen, your feelings are like gas. They pass. Amen. I'll let that set a minute. Feelings are like gas. They pass. In fact, I can change your feelings with just one line this morning. I can offend half of you. I'm not going to, so relax. And then in the next statement, it'll pass. In the world of social media and Twitter and Facebook, it's hard for feelings to pass because we have that constant accusation from the enemy all the time coming at us. And some of us are believing everything that's said and everything that's been told to us. And we live in that tower of failure. You see, being spiritually alive in Christ is a major theme in Paul's theology. In the New Testament, when you read through Paul's theology, he's always talking about the old is gone, the new has come, who we are. In fact, in 1 Corinthians 4, 17, look at it. It says, for this reason, I have sent you Timothy, who is my beloved and faithful child in the Lord. And he will remind you of my ways, which are in Christ. See, Paul was realizing who he was, that he is in Christ, just as I teach everyone in every city. Look at 2 Corinthians 5, 17. We've talked about this over and over again the last few weeks. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. You have been made new if you are in Christ. If you have surrendered your life to Jesus Christ, you are no longer who you used to be. 
See, some of you have reverted back and you've gone back to that. There was a time where that was true for you. But over the years, the accusations of the enemy and because of failure and struggles, you've gone back and you've believed that. Listen, you need to hear that if you are in Christ, you are a new creation. The old is gone and behold, new things have come. 1 Corinthians 15, 22. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all will be made alive. See, and when we were born the first time, we were born in Adam, Paul says. We were born into sin, but we are also in Christ made alive when we are born again, when we surrender our lives to Christ. You jump over to Ephesians chapter 1. I love this. And when Paul says this, Ephesians 1, 4 and 5 and 7 and 8, it says, God chose us in him, Christ, before the foundation of the world. In other words, before the world was ever created, God had you in mind. He had me in mind. That he chose us. That we would be holy and blameless before him. Did you hear that? That God chose us to be holy and blameless. In love, he predestined us to adoptions as sons through Jesus Christ to himself according to the kind intention of his will. And in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace, which he's lavished on us. And I love that statement, that he's lavished on us. That God just keeps, I was watching that water a while ago. We got the baptism really, baptistry really full. And I don't know if you saw a while ago that water that splashed out. That's what God has done for us. Through Jesus Christ, it is splashing out all over us in the righteousness that he's lavishing on us. That we've been chosen by God. We've been declared holy because of Jesus Christ. Not because of what we've done or what we could do. Some of you are really working hard. It's because of what God has done. That we've obtained an internal inheritance. We've been sealed by the Holy Spirit. In other words, here's what God says, that I am guaranteeing who you are with the Holy Spirit. I am guaranteeing what I've created you to be with the Holy Spirit. And if your reality doesn't match up to that, then understand this, that God says, I have guaranteed who you are. If you'll begin to believe what I've said about you, then I promise you, you'll see that gap closed and quit not looking for escapes and not trying to fill all those things. You are blameless. You are holy. You are righteous because of Jesus Christ. And I've sealed you as a guarantee Romans 8, 16 and 17, Paul says that the Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God, and if we're children, we're heirs also. Everybody wants to be an heir, don't they? I was, I was looking at the lottery this morning. I, I know, I shouldn't say that from the stage. 345 million. They're saying it could be as much as 600 million. I'm praying somebody in my family wins it because I want to be an heir to that, Amen. I know some of you are going, well, play it, stupid. I've never played the lottery. See, we love to be heirs, don't we? We love to get something. And here's what God's saying. The Spirit himself testifies, right? Spirit, we're children of God. And listen, we're children. We're heirs of everything God has. And why do we live below that? You see, positionally, several things changed when you were saved. For you in this room that maybe it was a revival years ago, maybe it was at a camp when you were a child, maybe, maybe you were saved here at Summit Heights, that when you confessed your sins and repented of your sins and you gave your life to Jesus Christ and, and, and he became the Lord of your life, he transferred you from the domain of darkness into the kingdom of his beloved son or daughter. That everything changed, that you went from being a nobody to being an heir to Jesus Christ. That means everything that God has promised Jesus is ours. Hello? Two amens. Amen. Come on. Amen. Come on. Amen. I'm telling you, man, you don't want to miss this. You've been transferred from darkness to light. The second thing is you're no longer in the flesh, that we are in the spirit. That our position has, yeah, y'all, yeah, we're still here. But listen, the way God has positioned us now that we are in the spirit and in Christ. You are not in the flesh, Romans 8, 9 says. But in the spirit, and if indeed the spirit of God dwells in you, then, then if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he doesn't belong to him. Listen, if you don't have the spirit of Christ, you don't belong to God. But if you belong to God, you are in the spirit. Therefore, you can do what God's called you to do. Some of you are just focusing on plan B. You got a plan B. 
And long as there's a plan B and you're out there working that plan B, then plan A is not going to work. Paul equates the idea of being in the flesh with the Adam. We talked about that. That we were born into Adam. So also in Christ, the second Adam, we are made new because of what he did. The scriptures goes on to say that we are a new creation in salvation. In other words, at the moment that Jesus Christ became the Lord of your life, at the moment you confess with your mouth and believe with your heart and you invited Jesus Christ to be the Lord of your life and confess your sins, then listen to me. At that moment, bam, you were given a new heart, a new creature, a new creation. But you are not who you used to be. In fact, Ephesians 5, 8 says, you were formerly darkness, but now you are in the light of the Lord. So walk as children of the light. Well, how do we do that, Edward? Well, you gotta start believing the right things and believe in what God's already said about you. Philippians 1.6 says that he who began a good work in you, listen to this, listen to this, some of you don't believe this. This is what Paul's saying. He started a good work in you, he's gonna finish it. He loves you. Look, look, look at this, position and standing, this diagram, that our position is in heaven, it's spiritual, it's life. It's new birth, new man, new nature, new creature. That we've been justified, we've been forgiven that we are in Christ. And I don't know about you, but you take that line on that left-hand side, that gives you confidence that you can love your wife the way God's commanded us to. That you can do what God's created us to do because we're no longer on earth, physical death, old man, old nature, old creature, condemned, guilty. And Adam, no, we have been made new in Christ. Over and over again, Scripture reminds us that we're no longer the same person who was born to our earthly parents, that we've been made new spiritual creatures by the power of God through Jesus, that we were valuable to God even before we were in Christ. In fact, look at Romans 5, 6, and 8. I love this. For while we were still helpless, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for the good man someone would dare even die. But, and here it is, this is good. God demonstrates his own love towards us. Failure is never final as long as love is alive. In that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That even now, look at me, even now in your sin, he loves you. It's not our achievements. It's not what we think we are on the outside, how pretty we are, how successful we are, how much money we have. Listen, while we were sinners, Christ died for us. And when we put our faith, faith, yes, faith. See, you practice faith every day. You practice faith when you turn on that light switch in your room. You go, I'm not a person of faith. Yes, you are. You'll practice faith in just a moment when I pray and dismiss you, you're gonna stand up. And by faith, you're gonna know, you're gonna pray your legs work, amen? And some of you, it's going to sound like shotguns going off and popping and all that stuff. But by faith, you're going to stand up. So you are a person of faith. The question is, where is your faith? Listen, God loves you and has a plan for your life. The Bible says, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. Listen, God's not a self-centered God. If he was self-centered, he'd have never given us Jesus. He stepped into our world. I hear people say, well, God's so self-centered and he just wants to control us. No, God loves you. He gave us Jesus Christ that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. John 10, 10 says that I came that you may have life and have it to the abundant. Listen, he wants us to live alive. That's why he came, a complete and full purpose-filled life. Not based on earthly stuff, based on what he has done. The problem is we're sinful and our sin separates us from God. We've all done things. We've all sinned. I, I told a little white lie a while ago. I'm 150 pounds. So we've all done it, hadn't we? And maybe you did this morning or maybe you did something far greater the reality is whether it's a little white lie or it's something really big, our sin separates us from God. In fact, Romans 3.23 says, for all of sin and falls short of the glory of God. And for the wages of sin, in Romans 6.23, 
says the wages of sin is death or separation from God. You see, God loved us so much and he saw our sinful condition that he sent Jesus into the world for us to not only die, but to raise from the dead three days later. So why you and I could be forgiven. So you and I could be worthy. So the good news is, is God sent his son. In Romans 5, 8, it says God demonstrated his own love towards us that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4 says Christ died for our sins. He was buried and he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. See, Jesus is the only way. It wasn't a confirmation that you went through at 13 and someone declared you saved. It's when you realize you're a sinner and your sin separates you from God. Or maybe you were dedicated as a baby. Listen, at some point, you realize your sin separates you. And when you realize that, and you realize the wages of sin is death, then you've got a choice to make. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father but through me. You can't earn salvation. Someone can't declare you saved. You can't even study a book and someone bring you up and dunk you in the water. Listen, at some point, you've got to realize that you're a sinner. And that you need a savior. Jesus said, I am the way. I am the truth. And I am the life. And no one comes to the Father but by me. It's not by going to church. It's not by being good. It's only through our confession that Jesus Christ is Lord. And through our repentance of walking with him. And walking away from sin. That we receive God's forgiveness. To turn from our sins. You see, Jesus knows you. And guess what? He knows you in your sin right now, and he loves you. And he would love to be in a relationship with you. Why? Because even before the foundations of the earth, he knew you. And he had you on his mind. And he knew you'd be sitting here today, sitting right in this place. And he says to you, you're worthy. In fact, you're so worthy, I gave my son for you. That if you would trust in me, and you would receive me as your savior. I'll save you and I'll make you new. Instead, we choose to live in ignorance and we choose to live in the dark side. But the reality is God loves you. And when we begin to take steps to learn about ourselves, we're better able to live in the earthly world that we're still here because we know who we are. And we know what God says about us, that we're fully loved and we're fully forgiven. And if we fail to understand those unmet needs and all those debts that are driving us, you're gonna have a hard time. If you're all your focus is on the tower of failure and you don't ever come over to this side and understand who God says you are, that you are a beloved son, daughter, because of your confession and your faith in Jesus Christ, that he has saved you and you are worthy that you are valuable, that God has a plan and a purpose for your life, and that you can close that gap, that you don't have to live in this failure the rest of your life, that you can round out your story of grace and move on to hope. As long as you're sitting over here, understand this, you won't round your story out to hope. It started with Jesus, it'll end with Jesus, and today, it's about Jesus. He loves you. He wants to be in relationship with you. He wants to forgive you, give you a new heart and a new identity that you can walk out of this place today knowing who you are, that you are fully loved and fully forgiven through the power of Jesus Christ. You see, three and a half, four years ago when I sat before my counselor and I was dealing with all this failure, I was dealing with all of this, he looked at me one day and I said, Ken, how long am I going to be a workaholic? He said, probably the rest of your life. <laughs> He said, because see, God gifted you. He gifted you. And it's always going to be that tension, Edward, that you're going to want to function out of balance. And that's why you've got to remember who you are and what God created you. And long as you will keep that in balance, see, it's that imperative and that indicative of knowing who we are in Christ, in the heavenlies, and knowing our condition on earth and out of obedience, we begin to live out of faith in the identity of who God is, and we round our story out to hope. 
that we round our story out to hope. You see, it's a lifelong process. Just because you got saved doesn't mean everything's gonna be all great for you, that you are gonna win the lottery, drive a Tahoe or Lincoln and have a big fat house, right? What it does mean though, is that God gives us a purpose and an incredible worth based on the person and work of Jesus Christ, that we are fully loved and fully forgiven. And whether you have a Lincoln or a Tahoe, a fat house or a little house or a tent, that's not who you are. If you have a relationship with Jesus Christ, you are a new creation. And by faith, you can begin to move towards holiness. You see, I don't wanna dig around the whole soul forever. I don't wanna poke around down there forever. And as I was praying Monday morning in that back porch, the Lord just kept saying, remind them who they are. Son, remind them who they are. Remind them who they are. Because there's some folks that are sitting here this morning, man, you, you've really screwed it up. And God still loves you. Isn't that incredible? And, and here, it, not only does he love you, he's inviting you right now. In fact, he's probably running towards you. That's why your heart's pounding out of your chest right now. That God's running towards you. And he is inviting you to step into a relationship with him. It ain't about joining a church. It's not about confirmation. It's not about being good. You're a sinner. I'm a sinner. I've been saved by grace in the Lord Jesus Christ, and I've been made new. He loves you. He has a plan for you. You're a sinner, and you're separated from God, but God sent his son to die for you. Would you receive that today? Would you? Let's pray together. Maybe you're here this morning. And you're holding on to a salvation that someone told you you were saved. But you realize this morning you're not. You realize this morning you're a sinner separated from God. And you need Jesus. And maybe you would just be bold enough this morning to pray this prayer with me. You ready? Just pray it with me. Dear God, I know I'm a sinner. And I ask you to forgive me. I believe that Jesus is your son. I believe that he died for my sin. And I believe that you raised him to life. I want to trust him as my savior and follow him as my Lord from this day forward. Guide my life. Help me to do your will. And I pray this in the name of Jesus. Now, if you prayed that prayer, no one looking around, every head bowed. If you prayed that prayer, would you just slip your hand up? Just slip it up, amen, yeah, amen, bro. Hold it up high. Anybody, yeah, I see you over here, amen. Hands all over the place. Now listen to me, with every head bowed, every eye closed, if you raise your hand, I want you to do something for me. In just a minute, I'm gonna pray. I'm gonna turn you loose. There's a place to your right called Grace Place. There's some elders and some counselors over there that would love to visit with you. And I wanna ask you to do something very courageous. In just a moment when I finish, I want you to get up and I want you to go over there. And they're gonna encourage you and they're gonna pray with you and they're gonna give you some material and they're gonna help you take that next step and your new identity because here's what happened. If you prayed that and you by faith believe that, then God is giving you a new heart. Maybe you're here this morning and you know you're saved but you're just living out of that failure. I wanna pray for you this morning. I want you to know who you are. Don't miss next week. You're gonna get the second half of this. Don't miss it. But I wanna pray for you with no one looking around. It's nobody's business. I just wanna pray for you. If you'd say, Edward, I'm struggling. I'm not sure I believe what you said this morning. I'm not sure I believe what the scriptures say. Would you pray for me? Would you just slip your hand up? Just hold it up. Yeah. Yeah. Anybody else? Just hold it high. Father, you see the hands, you see the hearts. And God, you see the hands that aren't raised of the deep, deep struggle that's going on. And God, I pray for that man, that woman, that teenager, that Father, you would right now just overflow in their heart how much you love them, how worthy they are, how good they are because of Jesus. 
God to give them the courage to believe and not just believe, but to walk out of here confident that they're fully loved and fully forgiven. God, give them courage. Give them faith. Give them faith, Father, that they'd walk out of here a new creation. And God, if there's sin they need to confess, I pray they'd confess it. If there's repentance that needs to be done, I pray that they'd repent. And God, you would give them a story of grace, a story of hope. Lord, I pray for those that raised their hands that they prayed that prayer of salvation. Give them the courage to go and visit with this group that's waiting for them, to encourage them that they'd walk out of here a new creation today. I love you. Thank you for Jesus. And we ask it in his beautiful and holy name. And everybody said, amen. Hey, look at me real quick. Look at me before you go anywhere. There's a table right here, okay? Uh, come sign up. Grace Place is right over here. If you need to see someone, man, please go over there. They want to encourage you, okay? Don't miss next week. It's going to be awesome. I love you. Have a great week. Hey, guys, welcome back. We hope you enjoyed the broadcast today. And if there's any decision you felt like God is leading you to make today, we would encourage you to... Uh, make that decision and to go online. There's a prayer tab on our website that you can go to. We'd love to pray for you. We would also love for you, if you accepted Christ today, to send us a text. We have a number at the bottom of the screen that you can text us the word accept if you accepted Christ. Or if you would like to know more about baptism, just shoot us a text with the word baptize to that number on the screen and we'll get to you, I promise you. Hey, have a great day and listen, if you're looking for a great church and you don't have a church home, come visit us one Sunday. We have two services, one nine, one at 11. We'd love to see you, have a great week.